Well, our background scripture, I didn't write it on there, but our background scripture is to which of the angels did God ever say, and this is out of Hebrews, the first chapter, to which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now, this is the writer of Hebrews talking about the superiority of Christ clarifying this with the Hebrews because the Hebrews were well aware, as I've told you, evidently, and as we showed you on that chart that we stretched out over here, evidently through not only scripture, not only the, the Decalogue, but also through the oral tradition of their, of their forefathers, they were aware of the activity and to a certain degree had been educated on angels. And so the writer of Hebrews wants to make sure that they know that Christ is superior to these beings they already have knowledge of. And he said, I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. He's referring to Christ. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who inherit salvation? As I was getting ready this morning, the thought leaped into my head that this would all be worthless, merely theological, um, perhaps interesting information, but useless if it were not for the fact that the scripture here and others in, in, uh, tell us that we all experience interaction with these beings called angels. If they operated totally disconnected from humanity, and if it was just we're going to study who they are organizationally, what they do, all of those things, and we said, oh, that was... You know, that was mentally interesting, but really we had no, they have no real uh, interchange with us, no interaction with us. It would be pretty useless. It'd be useless Bible knowledge. And um, I, really we'd be wasting our time. But I think it's important that we recognize that the beings that we are talking about, these created beings, you and I have and will in the future have contact with them. You may not see that contact, but you have contact with them. They are ministering spirits. And I believe me, they are active in your life every day. You may not know that. You may never see one, but that doesn't mean they're there. And, and you and I, they are sent to minister to us. We don't know how. Sometimes I'll pray, we'll pray, and it strikes me that I'll say, Lord, thank you for both the things we've seen you do and the things we don't know that you did in our lives today. The times that, you know, I, I believe that perhaps there'll be a revelation when we cross over into the realm of eternity that we will perhaps see, huh, I didn't even know that. That I, I was going to be in an accident and an angel did this or an angel did that. And there's all of this interaction and, and uh, play, inter, interplay, so to speak, in, in our lives. So the, indivi the, the individual creatures, these individuals that we're speaking about, uh, perhaps not on all levels that we will talk about, but we do have interaction with them. So what we need to, we're, at, we're on point three. This is a continuation and we're in part three. But today we're going to begin with speaking about angels are organized and are of great variety. It would be easy for me to spend a lot of time on all of these points because we could draw um, connections with what we see on earth. Let me just give you a scripture that isn't up here. But remember, if you will, that God told Moses to make the temple exactly. He told him he used the word exactly as I tell you to make it. Why? because I'm God and I want you to obey me. No, because it is an exact duplicate of that which is in heaven. So God told Moses, what you're making on earth is an exact duplicate of what's in heaven. So earth often reflects what's going on in the heavenly realm. And so organizationally, we see evidence of structure. And it's interesting that we also, government, is organized, and many of our organizations are organized. Where did we get that idea? 
because we, you know, we just happen to come up with it, we're created in God's image. And so this idea of organization, this idea of structuring for efficiency and effectiveness, that all began in heaven. So angels are organized and of great variety. Let's talk about the types of angels to start with. The one that I would like us to begin with is referred to in the Old Testament as the, the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord, not a angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord. And it's particular that we mention that, and the first time it's mentioned is in Genesis, the 16th chapter, where Hagar is fleeing. She is in a wilderness area, and the angel of the Lord appears to her and gives her a promise that she will be taken care of, her son will be taken care of. Another time we find that reference is in Exodus, the third chapter, verses 2 through 6, where the angel of the Lord appeared to, to Moses uh, in a flame of fire out of the middle of a bush. The angel of the Lord. And Moses hid his face because he was afraid to, quote unquote, look at God. The angel of the Lord is a reference to what we would call the pre-incarnate appearance of the second person of the triune Godhead of Jesus. This is the Christ. Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's Greek for Messiah, Christos. And um, so he is the Messiah, but Jesus has, the Christ has always been. The second person of the triune Godhead has always been. And so sometimes we see the pre-incarnate Christ making an appearance on earth in the Old Testament. And we see that mentioned the angel of the Lord. Now, that changes in the New Testament. After Christ becomes flesh, the Word, John 1 says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory. After the Word became flesh, then we no longer see the same type of reference to the angel of the Lord connected with the Lord Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Christ. If the angel of the Lord is mentioned, it is in reference to, the, to an angel that serves the Lord, Jesus Christ. And there's the difference. Clear to everyone? And so the pre-incarnate Christ, of course, only appears in the Old Testament. And therefore, then from that point forward, the angel of the Lord is not, a fear, not, not uh, applying to or, re or referring to Christ. The second type of angel we want to cover today is archangel. Archangel. Many of us have heard of that. Is, uh, archangel is uh, referred to, the archangel means chief angel. Chief angel. Found two times in the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 and Jude the ninth verse. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 speaks of the voice of the archangel. Very powerful, must be, because when Christ returns, he's not going to shout, but the archangel is going to shout. The voice of the archangel, the sound of the trumpet. Now, we don't know what that's going to, I don't know what that's going to mean. The voice of the archangel, we don't know. We can make a conjecture, but it could be symbolic. But it will be obviously a, lo a sound loud enough that every individual who is of Christ, both dead and living, will hear him, will hear that angel. Now that should give you some holy goosebumps right there. I mean, you all of a sudden you hear a shout and you hear a trumpet. It's coming down, right? And so the Bible speaks of the voice of the archangel and then... In, in Jude, the ninth verse, it's referring to Michael. It actually designates Michael as an archangel. I think we talked about the fact before that the Bible seems to imply very strongly that Michael is the archangel that is assigned to protect Israel and to protect the nation, the Jewish people. Your angel. Uh, and it, that, of course, is in the book of Daniel. Michael's referred to as a warrior prince. We find him, we find him, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in the future, but battling against evil powers and principalities. So Michael is a very powerful angel, and he is in a battle. 
And there's a battle going on in the heavenlies. And Daniel, I, I, I think I mentioned last week that Daniel is a very insightful book when it comes to angels. Daniel was a very favored man. Daniel, Daniel was very, in fact, the angels would say to Daniel, you are highly thought of. God thinks highly of you. And he had tremendous interaction. God could trust Daniel. And he gave Daniel interaction. And, and Daniel 10, you remember the story of the Daniel fasting for 21 days for an answer. Finally, an angel appears to him and the angel says to him, there's none who contends by my side. There's so much, there's so much interesting information here if you think about it. So these angels were fighting together, side by side, against evil forces. And he said, the angel that came to Daniel said, there's none that, fight by, none that fight by my side except Michael, your prince. Your prince. He's referred to as a prince. Isn't that interesting that, for example, in uh, monarchies, the government um, organization of monarchies, they have kings and they have princes. And he's referred to as a prince. Now, who do you think came first, Michael the prince or the English government? So my point being, heaven isn't copying us. We're copying heaven on earth as it is in heaven. And then in Revelation 12, 7, he's still fighting. John the Revelator is on the Isle of Patmos. He's seen things that are going to happen in the end. And God is telling him to share those with us. And he saw Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, Satan. And uh, he's called, again, one of the chief princes. So there's the archangel. There, we have reason to believe there's more than one archangel. But that is a classification, obviously, of angel. Very powerful. Then there are cherubim. Cherubim are the most frequently mentioned type of angel in the Bible. Mentioned over 90 times in the Old Testament. Only once in the New Testament. But nothing is mentioned of their appearance other than they evidently have wings and are of great splendor and power. Now, let me talk again about this idea. Humanity, mankind, um, natural man has put some ideas of who angels are in our minds that are not really true. Now, we're not saying that an angel cannot appear as a woman but the Bible never records an angel appearing as a woman. They always have the appearance of a man. Sorry, ladies. Um, but, so, but often you'll see artists make an angel like a lady. I remember a famous picture of two kids walking, an old painting of two kids walking a pathway, and there's an angel, a lady angel, with her wings spread over them. And um, nice picture just not biblical. So I'm sorry if I'm destroying some of your preconceived ideas here. Also, we were talking just before the, the lesson, nowhere does it say angels sing. The Bible does not record them singing. Sorry. We sing. The Bible records us singing in heaven, but they praise and they say and they worship. In Isaiah 6, as we'll talk about, they cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Interesting that they don't cry to God that. They don't say that to God. Do you know who they're saying that to? Each other. They're looking at each other and they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And the other one looks back at that one and says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. One time I felt impressed to do that in a Sunday morning service. I said, I want you to look at someone and say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And for them to look at you and say that back. And it was a very powerful moment. You know, God knows he's holy. What they're doing is declaring to all of creation, God is thrice holy, thrice holy, triune Godhead, thrice holy. And so they, they are mentioned 90 times. Exodus, the 25th chapter, 18 through 22, talks about the Ark of the Covenant. And it is cherubim that were assigned to protect the Ark of the Covenant. And... They also serve to guard the throne of God. 1 Samuel 4, 4. They serve as a throne, believe it or not, for God. This is very mysterious. It says that God is seated on the cherubim. That's mysterious. 
And 1 Samuel 4, 4, 2 Samuel 6, 2, 2 Kings 19, 15 refers to them as the throne of God. That's very mysterious. And the throne that can move. Uh, they also are describing, have, we know that they, in Ezekiel 1, 5, they're referred to, we get a little glimpse into, um, a little bit of a look into who they are, four wings. They have four wings. And the likeness of four living creatures. Four faces. Now, it doesn't mean each one of them, there's a little bit of a, nuance here in comparison to Revelation, where the four living creatures each had this, uh, four faces on four sides, but this could be that they each looked, each one singularly looked like a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. Certainly a lot of symbolism here. Those are cherubim. We're talking about powerful, mysterious creatures uh, that we are, we are going to encounter someday. We're going to see them. And then there, there are the seraphim. There's only one clear reference to this class or category of angels, and that's in Isaiah 6. And Isaiah 6 is Isaiah, I left my Bible there, who he said in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And his train, his robe, filled the temple. And, and, and in there it says, and the cherubim were crying one to another, holy, holy, holy. And, and the, the room, the throne room shook with the power of their voices. And Isaiah went on to say, woe is me. I am a dead man. I shouldn't be looking at what I'm looking at. I don't know how I got in here. But when somebody finds out that I don't have a pass, right, it's over. And so they're awesome creatures, and the Bible tells us they have six wings. Two that they cover their feet with, <coughs> two that they, they, cover their, they cover their feet in humility, representation of humility, cover their, their eyes in representation of awe, and two they fly with. And it speaks of them hovering. And again, the temple shook with power. So our God is an awesome God. He's created some awesome creatures. Now, it shouldn't surprise us that everything that God has created doesn't look like us. Right? That shouldn't surprise us. I mean, look how many creatures are here on earth that are absolutely freaky looking. I'm not saying angels are freaky looking. Sorry, angels. <laughs> but I mean, but look at the creatures they're still discovering. This thing that just washed up on the beach recently, did you see that one thing that was had spines and teeth all over its body and it lives in the deep and it washed up and they said, you know, it's amazing what they have to tell people nowadays. Don't pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, probably this generation would look it up. Should I pick this up? <laughs> On their phone. One of their friends will say, yeah, dude. <laughs> Don't, it, but, but God created that with all of the details, the intricacy. Just incredible to me. They didn't even, they didn't even know there, were, there was color in some portions under the water until, they, until all of a sudden they turned some lights on. And look at this. So God, I mean, God can create. He's, he's an incredible, he has all, all power, knowledge without a, any comprehension of, of ours that, as to how knowledgeable he is, why wouldn't he desire to create things that are, I'm sure at some point we'll understand why they look the way they look. It'll make perfect sense. So now we need to move to orders of angels. And um, let me flip the board over. We talked about seraphim. Sorry, I didn't flip quick enough. Let's talk about orders of angels. This is a very interesting subject and a very interesting, well covered. If you, if you Google orders of angels, you are going to find, uh, if I can find here, I, in my study, 
There's, a, there's many theories about the orders of angels, teaching doctrines. Be careful because some of them are from the occult and they're from witchcraft and, and they're, they're uh, sites that are talking about. They're very interested in angels. And I personally know of some individuals that, that really got involved in some things they shouldn't have got involved in. It got out of control because they started really seeking to know more about the angelic host. And they began to get into things they shouldn't have gotten into. And it opened the door for activity in their lives. So we, we, we must be careful because they're creatures and created just like us. But we're taught never to seek after them, to directly speak to them unless they appear to us. And then there's some tests that we need to do uh, to discern are they from God or not. But um, I saw the ty levels, types, and orders of angels. I saw one site that says there's nine. Another said there's seven. Another said there's 12. Another said there's 10. So you're going to find all types of information and people that claim to have all kinds of special insight into this organization of angels. And some of them are using some books from the Apocrypha. They're using uh, books that are outside of our accepted Bible and they're gaining their knowledge from that. But what we do know that is mentioned in the Bible are principalities, thrones, dominions, powers, authorities, and rulers. Now, <coughs> these are clearly they're categories of angels, both holy and evil. There's no reason for us to not recognize or to assume that the organizational structure of the holy angels of God and the hierarchy, the levels of authority and power, that the evil angels and Satan would not mimic that because they're battling with each other. Just as it's very common around the world, whether it's a communistic uh, regime or a democratic republic, which we are. We're not just a democracy, by the way, or a democratic republic. But it is, it is common for armies on earth. They have generals. We have generals. They may have little different nuances in the types of generals. But it's very common for there to be a similar organization, divisions, and platoons and so on and so forth. So we find that same type of organization reflected among angels. Now, there's some denominations even that have adopted a very detailed doctrinal position regarding different categories and structures, even to the point of assigning each one a rank. You'll get on some denomination sites and they have all the ranks figured out and everything. We really can't do that, we need to stick to what the Bible says. And although it seems to make sense that the order in which these categories are mentioned would imply descending order of authority, we have no definite scripture saying this. The scripture's silent about it. I mean, other than, again, other than the inferences that evidently an archangel is a very powerful angel because the Bible refers to an archangel in other wording as a chief prince. So we, we can gather from that, okay, up there. Where? We don't know, but definitely one of the stronger angels. And so some of the references are specific to God's holy angels. Some of them refer to like Ephesians, the sixth chapter, refer to the organization of the enemy's angels. And so we'll go down through these. Daniel, the 10th chapter, is again, tremendous insight, verse 13 and 20. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. See what the holy angel says. The prince of the Persian kingdom. Now he's referring there, there's an interchange between a reference to a holy, powerful creature and an earthly government. But also the, that earthly government is evidently the assignment of this angel. Because the holy angel says he'd been fighting with the prince of the Persian kingdom. He's not referring to an earthly human. He's referring to a powerful evil angel. And that evil angel, as we've talked before, has evidently been given the geopolitical assignment of Persia. So Satan is organized. And he's, he's, he has 
And I believe there are organizational structures over every area. I believe one of the reasons, if you've noticed when you drive into a different area or you go stay in a different area, it just feels different. Did you ever notice that? Can't explain it. A good illustration for us is it feels different, and this isn't a joke, when I drive across the Ohio River into West Virginia. And my wife and I went over there just a few days ago. When on, we took part of a day off and we took her convertible. And I said, where are we going to drive? So we went over to Route 2 and drove down Route 2. And when we crossed over the bridge East Liverpool and we're over there and we're kind of looking at a beautiful day. I, and I'm looking over at Ohio. I said, isn't it strange that I'm looking over into Ohio and it feels different over here than it does over there? I wasn't thinking about it. It just, what's going on there? I can't help but believe that what you're sensing is a spiritual thing. And you're sensing the organizational hierarchy and who's in control and to what level who's in control in a certain area. I've noticed that evil abounds in communities where the churches are weak. And I've noticed where churches are strong, there's still sin, but it seems to be checked. What's going on there? It is it all linked together to, to what's going on here. 10.01, I've got my timer in front of me. But then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. He was detained, there, or this angel was detained. Notice the word detained seems to indicate what? What does that, what does that seem to imply? Held, which, which is, if, if we were going to talk about fighting, and we were talking about boxing or wrestling, sounds like they're wrestling, doesn't it? If you're held, you're wrestling. What does Ephesians, the sixth chapter, I'm getting ahead of myself, but what does Ephesians 6, 12 tell us as Christians? Paul telling the Ephesian church, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Wrestle. We're not boxing. We're not punching them out. We're wrestling. And sometimes you're in your spiritual walk. I'm going to divert here for a moment, but, but I think this is needed. Sometimes in our spiritual walk, we go through periods of time where it isn't instantaneous. Maybe there'll be a time when you are momentarily struck with a strong temptation. But then there'll be periods of, of time as you walk with Christ that you'll go into what sometimes are described as a valley or a difficult time or a dry time or it just seems like, wow, it's been hard for weeks. What's going on there? You're wrestling. You're wrestling. That's what Paul was trying to teach the Ephesians. You're not wrestling against the next door neighbor or this person. That may manifest through people and you, that's the division, that's the diversion of the enemy. It gets you to focus on people when the real battle is in the spirit realm. We wrestle. Ephesians, the, by the way, I go to fight, I go, the prince of Greece will come. That word prince in Daniel comes from a word that I won't pronounce, but first or principal. The first of the prince, the first of Greece will come. And prince or principal translated, the prince will come. So Ephesians, the sixth chapter, we already referred to this. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Now here are the categories, but against rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Not referring to the heaven, the third heaven. Paul said, I was taken up into the third heaven. But referring to the second heaven, you and I can't see, unless God opens our eyes, where a lot of action is taking place. And angels, angels are able to travel. Angels are able to travel between all three heavens or all three dimensions. Dimensional travel is the ability to move through alternate dimensions. Oh, shut up. <laughs> I didn't ask you anything. Dimensional travel. 
You're being listened to. Um, so angels are able to go from the third heaven, the throne, throne room of God. It says that they go back and forth. They receive orders. The second heaven. So they can go from the throne room of God and, and go into the second heaven and engage the enemy or do whatever's necessary there. Come down into the first heaven, which is our atmosphere, which you and I see. That's a reference to the first heaven. And down into earth. Back and forth they go. But remember, I'm stuck here, so I'm just going to stay here. Remember the, all the insight that this scripture gives us. Where was the messenger angel that came to Daniel and he was praying and praying and praying and praying? What heaven was the messenger angel stuck in? He wasn't stuck in the throne room of God. Where was he stuck? The second heaven, where all the action takes place. Now there's action on earth too. But he said, I'm try I tried to get through to you. I tried. I left the first day. The answer was given to me in the third heaven on the first day. I came through into the second heaven and the prince of Persia grabbed hold of me. Trying to stop that answer. This is what the old timers, when I grew up in the church, I would hear the, the, uh, the older Christians who had a strong prayer life talk about praying through. I prayed through through. Well, that's a, that's a term to describe the fact that there was a release inside of them and they knew the quote-unquote answer was on the way. Reese Howells, Welsh miner in the early 1900s and during the Second World War, Churchill said of Reese Howells, who was a schoolmaster, and he was called a, an intercessor for God. He had a Christian school for girls, didn't he? Over in Wales. World War II, Churchill said, when Reese Howells prays, England wins. Talk about a compliment. And Reese Howells would receive very detailed information from God as to how to pray and what was going to happen. And he prayed that a bomb would not fall on the property of the school. That's a bold, that's, that's when Germany was bombing all over and not one bomb fell on that school property. It came right up to the line, but never, not, not one bomb fell during World War II on that property. So Daniel, wanted an answer. Many times today, we are in the, we're the microwave generation. We're the Siri tell me what this means generation. And we don't hold on and we don't understand that we have to hold on. It isn't because God isn't willing to give, it's because you are a partner with God and to a certain degree partners with angels. Angels are dependent. Angels were dependent on Daniel's prayer. Had Daniel not prayed 21 days and fasted, that angel said the first day you asked God, he sent me with the answer, I've been wrestling. And after 21 days of Daniel fasting, he didn't know that. He didn't know all of that was going on. It wasn't until the angel appeared to him that he, he got insight. You mean that's what's been going on? I've been praying 21 days. I wondered why God wasn't answering me. Many times we give up. We say, well, God just doesn't want to answer me. Well, how much time did you invest in prayer? How long did you wait before the Lord? How strongly did you persist? Were you like Daniel and you said, I'm not going to give up on this. I'm not giving up until I hear from God. Too often we don't do that. And that's called praying through. If we knew how important our prayers are to what's going on up here, I don't understand it. But God has, you are created in the image of God. We've talked about that. There's things that, that God has placed within our responsibility that the angels even long to look into. No other creature is created in the image of God. You are. And, and God has given us certain responsibilities and God gave them to us. And someday we may hear him say, hey, I put it in your hands. I gave it to you. I told you that. Why didn't you do that? Why didn't you pray? Well, I did. Yeah, you prayed 30 seconds. 
right? Oh God, I'm on the way to the grocery store. Oh God, and I'm not saying God doesn't answer prayer. God's instant in season, out of season sometimes. But sometimes you've got an answer that's so important that there's a battle going on in the heavenlies. It's a big one. And God is encouraging you to pray. Remember, one last thing. Remember, an angel came to strengthen Jesus while he was in the garden. What was Jesus doing? Praying. And what did he do after the angel came and supernaturally strengthened him? Kept praying. Because God said, okay, this prayer is so important. My son's physical strength is giving out. I'm going to strengthen him. For what purpose? So he can keep praying. There's something about prayer, isn't there? And it's interacting with very powerful beings. Very powerful. These were archangel level beings that Daniel's prayers were impacting. Never underestimate your power in prayer. That's why the enemy fights you so hard, to not pray. That's why he tells you, ah, it's doing no good. Your prayers aren't doing any good. How many of you have heard that, right? You say, you might as well give up. So, I went completely off track. It's 10 11, and, and we've got to stop. But I'll give you one more, or two more scriptures. Well, let's finish this. Colossians 1.16 mentions thrones, powers, rulers, and authorities. For in him, in Christ, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. And then Ephesians 3.10 says, May, might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realm. That's referring to the church. And that we're making things known. Romans 8, 38, 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. See that reference there? Principalities, powers, shall be able to separate us from the love of Christ. And Colossians 2, 10. Christ is over and the head of all rule and authority. Over, he's over and the head. So the good news is this. There is, there is no comparison between power of angels, the evil angels, or Satan, and all power of God. I mean, there is no comparison. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. That's pretty fast. And so, when, you know, when God rolls up his sleeve, so to speak, there's, there's no, so we're on the winning side is the point. Don't get nervous about it. <laughs> God, God, God's got it under control. But you and I need to persist. Okay. I hope, I, I, am, I am, the teacher always receives more than the student, they say. So I am receiving so much from this. The more I look into it, I hope that you too are um, learning useful information.